and say, hey, what was going on in 2019 at the end of the, the 2010s, uh, the end of this decade, what exactly was going on? And this is, it's, it's funny because I've been saying it's an alternative to Spotify and the commercial radio and all these other things. And accidentally, somehow I clicked on this Buzzsprout service. They had an I option to send to Spotify, and of course I'm kind of playful whenever I get a button, I tend to click on it, and so I clicked on that one, and so now apparently Spotify has been getting all these podcasts, and uh, which is their right. Uh, th this is a Creative Commons podcast, so you can download this, you can share it with your friends, you can remix it, you can do all sorts of things with it, but so if you are listening to this on Spotify, if you have somehow stumbled upon this podcast, please please listen to my words and disconnect and don't use Spotify. Spotify is terrible. They are basically a tool of the RAAA. They are a way to uh, take music and take control over what you listen to away from you. It is not a friend of yours. It is not a system that you should be giving money to. It is dangerous, but I, I guess I'm on it too. So uh, there's that. Now, as usual, uh, I guess on a personal note, I have not been feeling very well this this past day or so, and so if I'm sounding a little scraggly, it's probably because I have a cold or something, so hopefully uh, I can hold it together for the next 40 odd minutes, but I had a couple of people who were interested in participating today, and I told them that I wasn't feeling very good, and so they think every single one of them is, is bowed down, but that is not their fault. That is totally on me for being sick, not on them. So we will. I will try to get each and every one of them back on uh, the show at some point in the not-too-distant future. But for now, it is just me and my scraggly voice. So, as usual, since there is nobody else here, I do have some things to play. I actually have... I'm going to save one of them, however, to the end of the show. And I think it's actually going to be a regular feature that I'm going to end the show with this song. So... I might eventually try to like do a cover of it just because it's it's kind of a cool little piece of history. I will however talk about that last song at the end of the song. And I'm going to play two songs from a band I just discovered this week. Somebody recommended this band. It's a Creative Commons band, so you can go and you can download this stuff for free. Of, of course, if you enjoy the music, you can of course give them money. That's cool too. Personally, I have not given them money. I think they're interesting. It kind of reminds me of, I think it was Tangerine Dream, uh, some like 80 synth bands that like really play with this idea of creating these sounds that kind of create this emotion without, how would I put it, without, I don't know, it's, it, it's like they're, every single one of these songs is like a, a different environment, but they're very simple and they're very minimalist. Like it's probably one guy with a keyboard or one guy with a really fancy computer that's capable of generating all these sounds. So that's that's basically what to expect. And with that, I'm going to play uh, two songs. One is from their album, Kiana. Or this is, the band is called Polymer Witch. And so this, this album, Kiana, uh, has a couple of songs. And one of them is... FSFCK 
slash my slash memories, which is kind of a reference to a system tool in Unix, FSCK, which you uh, tend to only use when you're having a bad day. So I'm going to give that one a play, and then we're also going to play another uh, song off of them, which is, uh, which is the one I was looking at earlier. Oh, yeah, the bus stop, because I've spent a fair amount of time at bus stops over the past week or two, and I don't know, it's kind of interesting that somebody wrote a song about waiting at a, uh, at a bus stop entirely with these uh, synth keyboard things. So give both of those a play, and hopefully you enjoy, and hopefully the sound comes through okay. And obviously, if not, as usual, this video will be posted on YouTube and Mega in MP3 form, so you can listen to the song more clearly. And I will link, of course, to Polymer, which is Bandcamp so you can get the original from them. So I'll give both of those a play and see you at the end of the musical segment.
That last one I think was definitely fit for purpose. It's nice, relaxing, uh, not really too much going on in it, but it's definitely the sort of thing that I could see listening to while waiting at a bus stop. And that's all that's really important, really, is when you make something like that, that's specifically designed for some environment, and it works for that environment. I think it does. I think that that Palmer Witch stuff is appropriate for uh, what it's designed for. So anyway, other than music, of course, there's other things going on in the world. And one friend made a point this week that I was being silent on a topic. Now, I am an individual, and I don't think that I should have to not be silent on any individual topic. I don't think we quite live in the world where we all have to give our opinions on the moral outrage of the day, but I do have this show, and I do have my Fediverse and my Facebook, and I have something of a voice left. I'm not totally silent. And so when I'm called on to say something about a topic, I guess I kind of it makes sense that I probably should. And so this past week, it, one of the days this past week was Remembrance Day. And either on Remembrance Day or shortly before Remembrance Day, uh, Don Cherry went on TV and gave people who don't wear poppies shit for not wearing poppies here in Canada. And if you listen to what he said, he wasn't very specific about which people he was talking about. And when asked to clarify, he still clarified as the people who don't wear poppies is who he's referring to. But when he did that, a bunch of different groups all looked into what he said and saw what they wanted him to say, which was that people who are new Canadians, new immigrants, that they don't wear poppies as much. Now, I don't think he would necessarily disagree with that. And I think that's where the difficulty is on this particular issue, is because there is what he said, there's what we want him to have said, uh, or at least the people in the media who don't like him. But then there's the what he probably actually feels uh, in his heart of hearts, which is probably not too far from that. Because he is a p pretty open uh, person as far as his political beliefs go. And he has been so, uh, and has been on TV yelling into a microphone for decades. And so we have a pretty good idea of what he actually means. But nevertheless, he was fired and removed from TV in his position at Sportsnet over his opinions that are really no different than the opinions he's been yelling into the microphone about for decades. But who knows, maybe the, the moral character of the country has changed over the past 30 years, and maybe there's an improvement. Now, what, as far as the, the particulars of what he said, I don't find it as, as important to comment on that. I think a lot of people have already commented on, on it, and I don't find it all that interesting. Don Cherry is a loudmouth who, by his own admission, can't take criticism. And the problem there comes when he can't take criticism. He certainly dishes up criticism to everyone else. And he doesn't learn from his mistakes. And he doesn't really learn from other people. He doesn't appear to be interested in learning from other people. But that's fine. He's got his own shtick. Uh, a lot of people enjoy listening to him. All well and good. But is there an issue with someone being removed from their job where an expectation is built up over 20 plus years of what he's supposed to be allowed to say and then one day he's just completely removed because of the outrage on the internet. Now maybe it was what he said was so utterly offensive that uh, that was called for, perhaps. You can you can definitely believe that. As far as the, the it's like there's two parts of this, right? There's the, what he said and whether what should be done about him and maybe it is time for him to retire, right? Like, he's an old guy. He's obviously not keeping in touch with the moral panics of the day. Uh, but he's also old enough to have lived through World War II. And so when he says things about what the poppy means, we can't just write it off as some old guy who doesn't know what he's talking about. And I think part of the problem is there has always been two meanings of the poppy here in Canada. There's the meaning that is peace and the respect for peace and the end to war, the older meaning that came from the First World War. And there's the meaning that has kind of crept up, and especially we see in the United States with Veterans Day, the respect for veterans, the respect for military, 
the respect for militarism and the respect for war and endless war. And if we're honest, we're going to look at both of these things and see that they were always there. There was always people who believed in both sides of this. And we just had this kind of consensus that we wouldn't talk about it. And especially on Remembrance Day, people tend to not want to get into it. And I think that's where most of the friction is coming from, because people do see both sides of this and are uh, just bewildered at the other side, not understanding why they couldn't see it the other way. And in particular, there's this expectation that people have to participate in the rituals we have. Now, I, as I mentioned on Facebook, didn't participate in Remembrance Day this year. I was not feeling well enough to get up in the morning to, to go to the, the event. I didn't wear a poppy because I didn't leave the house. I had a poppy. I was ready to wear it. But I don't think that should matter. I think it, it's not mandatory. It's definitely a good idea and it's something that it does pay respect. But there's arguments to be made against it too. And I'm not going to make those arguments. But we live in a free society. And if people choose not to wear a poppy, I think that is also their right. So with that in mind, as far as how much I or anyone else should have to condemn Don Cherry, again, Don Cherry doesn't know what he's talking about most of the time. He probably does when he's talking about hockey. I don't know enough about hockey to know whether or not he's right about things like fighting, but he certainly doesn't seem to, again, learn from his mistakes be open to criticism. And that's a really bad sign. And so as far as anything else about him, should we be all freaking out about him? I think enough people are freaking out. I think if we want to freak out, that that, that level of freak out is kind of there. But the other thing too, the, the main thing I have a problem with on this whole issue is the that there are people out there. Basically, the, the way Facebook has allowed us to become is will share someone else's point of view and basically echo that whole point of view. Now, the, in this particular case, there's all these little nuances and people will get some of the details wrong. They'll get some things wrong about like what he said. They'll get some things wrong about, for example, the data in question, whether or not, I, I haven't seen anyone post any actual hard data on whether or not new Canadians or old Canadians wear more poppies. That's something that's relevant to the conversation, not particularly important, but it's, it's something that people could dig up, but nobody's bothered to, of course, because it's not about whether or not people wear poppies. It's about ideological conformity, either on the right or the left. And so there's that. But anyway, so what I have seen over and over and over again this week is people sharing things thought of by other people to basically save themselves the, the work of thinking for themselves. And that's basically the world we live in right now is, I mean, I, I run a meme page we have all these cached thoughts around us of things that other people have come to the conclusion of, so we don't have to do any hard work of thinking. And then when we see things like, for example, people will actually go to see, well, what did Don Cherry say? What were the actual words in question? What are the likely meaning of those words? If you don't agree 100% with them, then suddenly it's like a that alone becomes a social wrong. And so that by itself should be worrying to people that we're failing to accept that people can actually come to their own conclusion on this. But in addition to that, there's what he actually said. And what he said was not, I again, I don't think that he should have given people shit for not wearing poppies, especially new Canadians, personally. But he did. That's his job. He's a loudmouth on TV who gives people shit for all kinds of things. The people who are watching him was it, that's what they were expecting. And there have been all sorts of clips from like two decades ago of him saying exactly the same thing. So it's, it's reasonable to expect that he probably thought that that's what was expected of him. And he was rewarded every time, even up until the, the point where it was put on television this week. His teammate or whatever you want to call him, Don McLean or whatever, uh, gave him positive feedback as he was saying it. It was only after the moral outrage started that people started backing away from what he said. So anyway, as far as whether or not he should have a job, again, I think people should be boycotting Sportsnet, just period. I don't think people should watch TV. I don't think people should watch the NHL. This is part of the NHL. The NHL has been a, a, attacking the internet since the beginning of the decade. It's a giant money-making machine, mostly for big U.S. corporations. It has long since been 
uh, something that is just purely in the Canadian interest, which is, of course, something that he would have probably been all interested in promoting. But the whole thing is a sham. So as far as his role in it, uh, I think he's part of a bigger problem. But if we're going to keep the NHL around, and if we're going to keep Sportsnet around, then what are they going to replace him with, right? They're just going to replace him with another loudmouth. And the other thing, too, I found a, an article... Uh, it was actually about another guy. There's a, a, the same day that Don Cherry was being sacked. There's a guy in the States on the left side of the political spectrum, by the looks, who also got sacked for, again, talking about things that were not sports on Remembrance Day in, as part of a sports broadcasting network. Now, I don't know the full details on that, but it sure sounded like it was part of the attempt to r remove a anything critical of the government of China from uh, U.S. sports airwaves. And it was interesting to me to read that article to see every single thing they said about him applied to Don Cherry. And so in this case, we may look at Don Cherry and go, okay, well, he's on the right, so it's okay if he, he gets removed. But when we say that, we have to be really careful because, again, the same logic is being used by the government of China to take people off of the airwaves that they don't like. And so it, we're in really, really dangerous territory at this point. And what's more dangerous to me is when people complain about people being removed for their political beliefs, all kinds of people are coming out of the woodworks basically saying, oh, but it's okay. It's not the government censoring him. It's just a company. And he has no right to say things that are on his mind. And it's okay if we just like remove his right to make a living based on his politics. And I even heard someone or saw someone say, quote, we don't have freedom of speech in Canada, unquote. And this is the part that worries me right right there. Uh, when people believe enough to share other people's pre-thought, pre-digested thoughts, saying things like, oh, yeah, we don't even have the freedom of speech in Canada. Of course, it's false. It's totally untrue. We do have the freedom of speech, although we've, it's been whittled away over the past couple of years with things like C-51 and the... Christchurch call and other things like it. The Trudeau government is working on getting rid of freedom of speech. But historically, we have had freedom of speech in this country. And it's one of the things that differentiated our country, Canada, from the rest of the world. And one of the reasons why things like World War II happened, where you had part of the world where you weren't allowed to say things that were critical about the government. And if you did, you would be taken out and shot. That was how it worked. That's what not having freedom of speech means, is when you can anger some group that can compel you to say or not say certain things. And going back to the, the government, thing, there's this article, I'll probably link to it, that makes the point that there's places in the world right now, like, for example, Russia, where according to the government policy, there's a lot that's allowed. And even with the their constitution and with the official policy being that they can that you can say whatever you want, in practice, you're not very free at all. Because there are the brown shirts or the, the equivalent of brown shirts that will go and rough you up if you say the wrong thing. And they're not officially part of the government, but they might as well be. And they basically enforce ideological conformity through violence on political dissidents or anyone else who says the wrong thing, uh, journalists and the like. But they're not part of the government, and it's not the government that's enforcing it. And yet they really don't have freedom of speech because of it. Another thing that was happening this week on this kind of line is on the Fediverse, there has been a slow grinding down of one server specifically, new.mo, but all of the servers effectively that allow people to say whatever they want. And the what has been happening is people have been gradually pointing out extreme things that various users of all these servers have been saying, and then using this as an excuse to block the whole server. So this, if you imagine it kind of like a telephone network, you it would be like if someone in Milwaukee said something bad, like maybe there's a KKK member in Milwaukee or something, and so the whole city of Milwaukee gets cut from the phone network, not until they can remove the guy, but permanently. And this has been happening on the Fediverse, where there are servers that will just utterly block entire other servers and block lists that are shared so then entire collections of communities are just not able to communicate with each other which is really sad because it's the whole point of the network was to avoid the censorship that a centralized networks like twitter faced but we're kind of reinventing that <laughs> in the, the uh, decentralized world and you specifically this this server that i was on pointed out 
it was it wasn't even that the things people were saying were so offensive is that they were defending other people against censorship and that in itself was enough to get the server blocked across the network and so this is kind of the next step is once you lose the ability to express yourself the next thing that people come for is your ability to defend the when other people lose their ability to express themselves and that actually there was it's not just this new.mo that lost this week because of that but there was another guy by the name of John DeGoes which there was one of his videos was removed from YouTube it sounds like he was disinvited from a, an academic conference all because he is standing up against codes of conduct again which are removing or causing people to be removed and censored and removed from academic uh, situations for the criticizing the, the, the process of having people who criticize the process removed. And so there's this big long post by this uh, meta.plasm.us about this John DeGos, about what he's doing. And if you go through and read it, most of what he's doing is based, again, looking at the other people who are being silenced and complaining about that. And one of the people who was silenced is a guy by the name of Cur Curtis Yarvin. Now, Curtis Yarvin is almost like a, a comic book character level of, he, he's just so far out of the Overton window that it's, you, you almost can't even call him right wing anymore. He's, it's, he's kind of a monarchist, I think, and really harkens back to the, the French Revolution or pre-French Revolution days in terms of his thinking. And he explicitly tries to read old books to inform himself of the how politics works and how politics can work. And he has written at length about his ideas, and you can think whatever you want about them, but he was removed from a conference on pure, basically pure mathematics and computer programming. And like the purest of the pure mathematics and computer programming, like this is stuff that has nothing to do with politics or it's almost like nothing's even implemented that touches real systems in this part uh, of LambdaCon, and yet he was removed from it because of his politics. And you can disagree with his politics, and especially uh, some of it I'd encourage you to disagree. But again, this is someone who's being removed from contributing to the, the scientific world with his ideas, again, because of his politics. That is a problem. That is a something that we have to watch out for and something that if we find ourselves doing, we have to be very, very careful when doing it. And so someone put together a, a torrent of all of his public talks, and these are going to be talks on technical subjects. But nevertheless, they're, one of them, again, was one of his videos was removed, was censored because of what he said in other contexts, because of who he was rather than his ideas themselves. And so that is the recommended media for the week, is to go out and download those videos. And if you're a computer programmer, maybe give them a watch. Uh, if you're not a computer programmer, just give them bandwidth. Like, just let it seed on your torrent network. So there's that. Uh, the other thing that happened over the past couple of weeks is Sastel went on strike, and they came back from strike. And one of the things that I did as part of that is I did not want to be crossing the picket line, even using the service that Sastel had. And that is not something that the union asked people to do. But it's still something that I did. And so I disconnected, well, I seasonally suspended my Sasktel account, so I would still have a Sasktel account, but I wouldn't be paying for it. And then I got a Shaw account, and then after the strike ended, re-enabled my Sasktel service, which I'm now broadcasting on, and then the tried to give back my Shaw modem. Now the problem was, is Shaw demands that you call their call center before you bring the modem back. So I didn't realize this, and I went to the north end, it's quite a, a far distance to the north end from where I currently live. And I tried to give them my modem, and they wouldn't take it. So I went back home and then called this call center. Now, it turns out there's three numbers that you can call. There's the main helpline. There's the loyalty number uh, to basically have them convince you to not leave. And then there's a third secret loyalty number that I didn't know that I had, but I guess I had. And so I called the normal help number. And it took me, I think it was like nine hours before I gave up the first day, <laughs> sitting on hold, waiting for Shaw's technical support or account support to answer. And then the next weekend, because I worked all week, I didn't have time to putz around with this, I called again and again, waited something like eight or nine hours. Altogether, it was over 16 hours of waiting on hold for Shaw to have a human being 
to answer the phone. Now, the fact that when they answered the phone, they still didn't really know what to do with me, that, that's something. But just the fact that I had to wait and sit on hold for over 16 hours, is that's such a waste of my time. I brought it to a, a board game, uh, my laptop to a board game tonight, and just sat on hold in a room full of other people so that other people could see that Shaw's customer service is so atrocious. And especially considering we here in Saskatchewan live and people in Thunder Bay live in places where you don't have to use Shaw, that experience of me sitting on hold for 16 hours should be a clear sign to the rest of you to fight to keep T-Bay Till owned by your local community and to keep SaskTel owned by the Saskatchewan government. Because if SaskTel is lost, Shaw and their service are what you are going to be stuck with. It's going to be hard, if not impossible, to get something better than that back into Saskatchewan and better than Shaw back into Thunder Bay if T-Bay Till or SaskTel are lost. And it is very possible to lose SaskTel. The Sask Party government here in Saskatchewan has done a study on what it would take and what would the consequences be of privatizing SaskTel. This is something they paid a good amount of money for. This is taxpayer dollars funding this study. So they want to do it. And they've always wanted for decades to get rid of it. And they're getting closer and closer by hollowing the company out from the inside. The strike itself, they only got like zero, zero and one percent raise. So like they basically got nothing for going on strike and for negotiating their contract. They got a pay decrease in real terms. And so things are not going well for the employees inside the company, even after a strike. But again, it's from the perspective of a customer uh, having to wait 16 hours to, to basically stop giving them money. And this is the big worry, right? I wanted to stop giving them money. I didn't want to have another month bill another $30. And I think I wound up getting dinged for $30 because it took so long to get off of their service. And it is an exit cost. Exit costs are the worst kind of cost, but uh, it was just really, really hard to get off of this service. So that was something that took a lot of my time over the past week. But it's, again, not the only thing going on. One of the other things going on over the past couple of weeks, and this is from Vice.com, quote, Comcast is lobbying against encryption that could prevent it from learning your browsing history. Other board has obtained a leaked presentation internet service providers are using to try and lobby lawmakers against a form of encrypted browsing data. So, quote, internet giant Comcast is lobbying against U.S. lawmakers against plans to encrypt web traffic that would make it harder to for ISPs to determine your browsing history. Da -da. The plan, which Google intends to implement soon, would enforce the encryption of DNS data made using Chrome, or meaning sites you visit. Okay. So privacy activists have praised Google's move, but ISPs are pushing back as part of a wider, wider lobbying effort against encrypted DNS, according to the presentation. Technologists and activists say this encryption would make it harder for ISPs to leverage data for things such as targeted advertising, as well as block some forms of censorship by authoritarian regimes. Uh, Mozilla, which makes Firefox, is also planning a version of this encryption. Uh, these slides overall are extremely misleading and inaccurate, and frankly, I would be somewhat embarrassed if my team had provided that slide deck to policymakers. Marshall Irwin, Senior Director of Trust and Safety at Mozilla, told Motherboard in a phone call after reviewing the sections of the slide deck. We are trying to essentially shift the power to collect and monetize people's data away from ISPs and providing users with control and a set of default protections. So, put. So, this is a problem that has been around for a while, which is that we, if I'm understanding it correctly, the whole problem comes from the fact that DNS, a, the name service uh, system that the internet uses, is designed, was designed in the day before, certainly before mass surveillance, but when encryption, we were still in the first crypto war, and it wasn't uh, as common for internet protocols to use encryption because there was this social stigma against it uh, in that you were expected to, that the data going from your computer to the rest of the network, that nobody was listening to it. And so who cares uh, if it wasn't encrypted? Well, we now know that when data leaves your computer and travels over, as soon as it hits the first router uh, in your house, that router is probably compromised by the NSA. It's probably compromised by other things than the NSA, and your data is going to be scooped up and used against you. And ISPs have been getting better and better at going through the data 
that is sent in clear text over their network and understanding what it is. And then again, doing things like sending target marketing at you. And if ISPs aren't doing it, other agents are as well. So there is this problem that DNS, one, it's, it's a centralized system. So you can, for example, if you get a, a website, you have to deal with an agent of what's basically the US government in order to get one of these domain names. And then when other people go to your website, they have to do a lookup a look on these servers to basically find out what the IP address is uh, for you. And that lookup is currently done primarily in the clear. And so people have been thinking about this for a long time. Obviously, uh, Google and Mozilla are both close to making encrypted DNS lookups a standard so that the metadata of what you what sites you're going to, if not, I mean, not, not the content on the site, but just the site itself is not going to be available to a passive uh, onlooker. So right now, for example, if you go to, oh, I don't know, Pornhub, even if you, the person who's watching your connection doesn't know what you're doing on Pornhub, they probably have a pretty good idea of what you're doing on Pornhub, even if that's all they get. And they will get that if they're sniffing your DNS traffic and if you're not using something like Tor. Now, if you're using something like Tor, the Tor uh, browser has already done uh, a lot of work in terms of anonymizing DNS lookups. This is something that is, makes it kind of annoying to use Tor on other browsers, uh, Tor used to work a lot better on other browsers because we, they didn't used to uh, force people to go through this secondary uh, DNS lookup system, but they do now. So it's it's kind of, as far as I understand, more or less already addressed on the, the Tor side. So if you want to already get a glimpse at how your web browsing can be protected, just start using the Tor browser. But anyway, what it sounds like they're doing though with Comcast is they're going to pressure the U.S. government to not allow Google to use this encryption. Now, if they pressure Google to not use it, they're not just going to pressure Google. They're going to also pressure Mozilla and whatever future web browser comes out of this, and not just for the United States, but for the whole world and the entire world's Internet users. This is all being done for one American company or maybe a couple of American companies. And so, yes, there are systems like Cloudflare. Again, we're going to talk about Cloudflare later that offer kind of alternative implementations, but they, it's, they're, they're going to try to, to, again, use the force of law to remove your ability to protect yourself using technical means. And it's going to be hard for them to do it, but it looks like they're trying. So let's see here. Talks more about different people and their uh, kind of opinion on it. But yeah, that, it's something important to watch anyway. And so if you know anything more about Comcast's attempt to outlaw this, definitely uh, send me an email as I'm interested in knowing about it. So there's that going on. Then uh, there's one last thing I kind of wanted to talk about, which is the, I think it's becoming a, for some people, expected because everyone has cell phones, especially in relationships, like you know, romantic relationships, that the other person be available to answer text messages the other person be available to answer your ping, your request for a human contact 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that it doesn't matter what you're doing, what you're focusing on, that you'd have to be able to drop everything and respond to a question or a, a, a text message of some kind. And this is not something that has always existed. Up until, even when cell phones were new, you, there was plenty of places you could go where cell phone reception was not all that good. And because there wasn't a critical mass of people with cell phones on them at all times that they were on at all times doing stuff with. I think it wasn't until fairly recently that this became really a, a thing people even could do, never mind that they could expect. But I think people are starting to expect it now. And I don't think it's a very healthy thing. I think it's something that reduces our ability to not just focus, but have independent lives and independent thoughts and independent personalities that if we allow ourselves to be ba basically constantly available, it reduces the trust that people have in each other. And it makes us very unable to see the other person as taking care of themselves. It's closer to a need thing, right? And is being needy to an extreme level where you have to always be, right? Now, there is value in being close to people and there is value to having the, kind of deep connections and even being there for other people a lot of the time. But I think it's necessary to have some space 
And if you're getting yourself into a new relationship and the person you're getting into the new relationship is demanding that you have no personal space whatsoever, I think that that's not a healthy thing to get into. And it's a, a kind of a warning sign where if that person is saying that, that that is something to, to be really, really careful about because you can definitely get yourself into a situation where you want more time or you want more space, but you won't be able to get it because you built this expectation of always being present. And it is not all relationships work, not all people, even if you give them a whole bunch of your time and attention and focus, will not necessarily reward you for it, but uh, understand that the, your presence will find it meaningful, right? There is, in all relationships, a balance between what you put in and what they put in. And it's important to find that balance and find the balance that works for you. But again, just be very careful if you're giving someone 24 seven access. And this isn't just human relationships too. Same thing with work. I had the support phone at, at Saskatchewan International. I was on call 24 seven. It was a fairly stressful thing uh, to uh, never be able to get away from a computer far enough that if something went wrong that you couldn't respond to it. Because you start training yourself when you give yourself this kind of 24 seven real time access. You start just thinking in terms of not going too far beyond where you can respond and you start feeling uncomfortable if you get, like if, if you lose your phone, you, you start getting phone anxiety, right? And the anxieties build up and they, if you have unrealistic expectations about what you can be present for and what you can be focused on, you're going to build up all these anxieties and you're going to live in this world of anxiety and I hope that people listening to me at least know there is an alternative to living like that. And that people, most human beings throughout human history have not lived in a real time feedback situation enabled by technology of the kind that I think people are starting to expect. And for the most part, they did just fine. So anyway, uh, as promised, computer timed out here. Uh, I'm gonna play this little song here. Hopefully it comes through okay. Computer is locked. This is an annoying part of Chromebooks. So that the, you can either have like a uh, timeout uh, or no timeout, but there's no kind of really long timeout. It's kind of unfortunate. Anyway, there's this thing called uh, Tokyo Rose. And what it was is in the Second World War, the government of Japan funded these women that were, from the sounds of it, Japanese American women, that the they spoke utterly fluent English. And so they were, as far as you listening to them goes, uh, sounded as American as anyone else. But the or what, what they were doing was they were trying to demoralize the war effort before and after the war. And so they broadcast all this stuff ac across the Pacific. But it was interesting the way they did it because they would actually do news, entertainment, uh, possibly sports, and music. And they would basically encourage the soldiers to miss home and to miss the music that they would love and to basically just feel to to see a human side of the world war and to to see the the struggles that their armies were having and so they'd rep report on negative things happening mishaps and attacks on allied forces and things that were going wrong and so if you listen to this radio station you get kind of this biased impression of that the war was not going all that well and you might as well just be at home and all that sort of thing but it's interesting because it was the emperor of japan who is basically funding all this thing this the and so it's it's old enough that it's in should be in the public domain by by now and it was utterly seemed to be illegal the people involved were some of it one of them was actually charged with treason one of the highest crimes you can be charged for in the states and spent some time in jail before being pardoned for uh, basically just being someone on the radio but i don't know i, I find it kind of interesting that there's this uh, part of history that what they were doing, their contribution to the war effort was just playing music and talking. So with that, I'll play the goodbye track and we will see you next week. Continue to know, but in the meanwhile, always remember to be good and so... Goodbye now. Goodbye now. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye now. Goodbye.
if I know the trip by taxi was far. We'd linger longer if I had a car. No use to fly. And now goodbye. There's one advantage to all leaving. It brings about a special kiss. I hope that